Hey guys, thanks so much for coming back to my channel. I appreciate you stopping back in. I'm really excited to tell you about the gangster this week. Last week was really bad. I really didn't enjoy the guy that I was telling you guys about. But this week is a super interesting gangster and I can't wait to tell you guys about it. So let's get started. Umberto Albert Anastasio was born on September 26, 1902 in Parcalia, Italy, which is in Calabria. I know I butchered those names, I'm so sorry. His parents, Bartholomew Anastasio and Mariana Polistena, had nine children. His father, Bartholomew, was a railway worker, and he actually passed away pretty early in Anastasio's life. He passed away just after World War I, and that left his mother to raise all of the children that she had on her own. Because she was on her own and Italy was in a very bad economy at the time, they grew up in utter poverty. They had nothing. Anastasio dropped out of school in the fourth grade. Him and his brothers started working on a freight train. And in 1919, Anastasio, who was 16 years old at the time, was working on the freight train with his three brothers, and they were working as deckhands. And the freight train was being moved through America. It was being moved through Brooklyn. While it was going through Brooklyn, the four brothers jumped off the train. So the train was on a boat, and the four brothers jumped off of the train onto the boat, and then off of the boat and swam to shore. They swam to the Brooklyn dock in the middle of the night, and without shoes on, they made their way to a relative's home, and they hid there at the relative's home until they were able to find work. All four brothers began working as longshoremen on the Brooklyn waterfront, and the Brooklyn waterfront at the time was not a good place to be. It was in the midst of a turf war. The turf war was for control of the Brooklyn waterways, and it was between the Irish and the Italian mafias. Everybody who worked there fought for the position of hiring boss, but once you got it, it was actually pretty lethal. There were 12 unsolved homicides in one location in 10 years, and every single one of them were carrying the title of hiring boss. And at the time, most of the people that worked on the docks were illegal immigrants who came in from Italy or Ireland, so nobody ever testified about any of these murders or any of the crimes that happened at the time because they didn't want to be deported for cooperating with the police. Anastasio was a short, stocky, muscular guy. He was huge. And he had gigantic hands. And a lot of people said that he reminded them of a bull. He quickly started a gang. And by the age of 18, he was leading an entire gang of thieves that would steal cargo from the docks. So there would be incoming freight on ships and they would go in and they would steal the freight off of the ships. They would steal sometimes everything on the ship, but most of the time they were just stealing a few things here and there from the ships themselves. There was another gang boss that worked there on the docks with them. His name was either Joe or George. I've seen it equally represented, so I don't know which one. But his last name was Torino, and he was another gang Gang boss, he demanded payment from anybody that was engaged in any kind of criminal activity on the Brooklyn waterfront. Anastasio was the type of man that you just did not mess with. So when Torino started going after Anastasio and telling him that he had to pay to complete the illegal activities that he and his gang were engaging in, Anastasio and Torino got into a fight. It turned brutal. The two fought to the death and it was extremely bloody. It was brutal. And Anastasio ended up beating Torino to death on the Brooklyn waterfront in front of many, many, many witnesses. The witnesses actually ended up testifying and they told the police that Anastasio actually enjoyed killing Torino, which really freaked them out because they had seen people be killed, but it was always a business interaction. But everybody that was there, they all reported to police that this man just, he enjoyed it. They could see it in his eyes. They could see it on his face during the fight. He enjoyed beating this man to death. Anastasio was convicted of murder on March 17th, 1921, and he was sentenced to death. He was sent to Sing Sing Prison in Ossining, New York, and he was on death row, and he was waiting for the death penalty. It doesn't just happen right then and there. And while he's in Sing Sing, Anastasio actually keeps getting into physical altercations. He's showing no signs of remorse. He's 
showing no signs of rehabilitation. And usually when people are on death row, they find God, they repent, they apologize to the families, they change. That was not the case with Anastasio. He just kept going. He made friends with the barber in Sing Sing, and everybody called the barber the Shiv. And the Shiv was the scout for gangs outside of the prison. The Shiv reached out to one of the bosses of the New York families, Lucky Luciano, and he let him know, hey, I have somebody that would be perfect for you. But the only problem that there is is that Anastasia is in prison and he's on death row. Lucky Luciano at the time was an up-and-coming mob boss in New York, and the Shiv recommended Anastasio because of his roots with the Brooklyn docks. He knew that that would help with the bootlegging operations that Lucky Luciano had going on at the time, and also because Anastasia was known around the prison to have a ruthless persona. So Lucky Luciano steps in. He brings his lawyers to work for Anastasia because he decides he wants Anastasia on his side. So Lucky Luciano's lawyers go to work, and by 1922, Anastasio won a retrial. The retrial was found because of a technicality in the original trial, something tiny went wrong, but it did get him the chance to get a completely new trial from scratch. When the retrial took place, four of the witnesses that the prosecution had used to put him behind bars had disappeared. So by this time, they had all had a chance to get rid of them in some way, shape, or form, whether they were killed or paid off to not testify the second time. Either way, they weren't there by the time this retrial happens. Anastasio won the retrial and he was released a free man without any charges ever showing on his record. During this prison sentence, his last name was changed to Anastasia. Anastasio's grandson posted that he changed his name because he didn't want to be tied to his family with the media showing his criminal background. I'm not really sure how that works though because as far as I'm seeing, he wasn't in the newspapers or the media yet. But either way, he changed his name to Anastasia, so now he was Albert Anastasia. Anastasia left prison as a free man with a huge thirst for blood and a newfound notoriety in the New York underground as the guy who beat the electric chair, and he also had a debt to pay to Lucky Luciano. The Castella Marisi War broke out, and this is a war between Joe Massaria and Salvatore Maranzano. I go a lot further into the war in my video about Lucky Luciano, so if you want to know more about what goes on in that war, you could go ahead and check out the Lucky Luciano video. There's a lot of detail in that one, so I'm not going to go too far into that on this one. But Anastasia joined a group called the Young Turks, and the Young Turks was a group within the two factions of Joe Massaria and Salvatore Maranzano, and it was a group of the younger gangsters who fought to modernize the American Mafia, and there was gangsters from both sides on this team of the Young Turks. Anastasia was a member of the Young Turks, and he was a part of the group that assassinated Massaria in order to end the Castella Marisi War. Again, go check out Lucky Luciano's video if you want to hear about the Castella Marisi War who Joe Massaria was, Salvatore Maranzano was, and what it was over, and why Joe Massaria was killed. So now the Castella Marisi War is over, Massaria is dead, and Anastasia is working on the docks on behalf of the Italian Mafia to assist with the bootlegging operations, and eventually he rose to power there. He became the leader of the International Longshoremen's Association. This was a legitimate enterprise, and it controlled the labor unions in Brooklyn. So Anastasia had a pretty decent amount of power on his own outside of the family. On June 6, 1923, he was sentenced to two years in prison for illegal possession of a firearm. Even though he wasn't a felon or anything, he was living in New York. If there's anything that New York is known for, it's, it's extremely democratic. It's almost impossible to get a carry permit in New York. So he probably wasn't even doing anything wrong. He probably just had a gun on him and that is 100% illegal in New York. Always has been, always will be. The underground world was changing. It was organized 
organizing together in the name of more profits and less bloodshed, the National Crime Syndicate, the Commission, and the five families had all been established to designate turf and divvy up profits. Anastasia was indicted on murder when he killed another man with an ice pick in 1932, but nobody was willing to testify, so the case was dismissed. He was indicted again on murder charges of a man who worked in a laundry, but same old song and dance, no witnesses, no crime, no time. Prohibition came to a close in 1933. When that happened, the lucrative bootlegging operations that the family had been doing kind of disappeared as well. At this point, Anastasio's position at the docks was kind of useless. I mean, he still stole stuff, but the whole point of him being there was to help with the bootlegging operations to get the alcohol from outside shipped in safely. Once this happened, he really didn't need to be at the docks anymore, so he left. When he left, he actually left it in the power of his brother. So he left his brother to run the Brooklyn docks, and he went and bought a warehouse in Pennsylvania. In 1937, he married Elsa Barknisi. Together they had four children, two boys, Umberto and Richard, and two girls, Joanna and Gloriana. The National Crime Syndicate organized, like, a corporation, and with that comes departments... Luciano really appreciated Anastasia's loyalty all throughout his rise to power, because by this time, Salvatore Maranzano had also been killed, and Luciano was forming the building blocks for what we know now as organized crime and the five families in New York. So because Luciano appreciated Anastasia's loyalty so much, he teamed him up with Louis Lepke Buchalter, a top-earning labor racketeer in Lansky's Mafia. That's Meyer Lansky. Meyer Lansky was a Jewish Mafia member. He ran the Jewish Mafia and was inseparable with Lucky Luciano. They were, they were best friends. From the start, they began in their friendship when they were kids. So he took Lepke and he put him with Anastasia and the two formed Murder Inc. The two together led the group, which was also known as the Brownsville Boys. And the group was made up of Italian and Jewish mafia hitmen. Murder Inc. was a group that carried out all the hits that were ordered by either of the families. So if the Italian mafia or the Jewish mafia needed somebody killed, instead of just letting everybody kill who they wanted, they had a specific faction that would go out and kill the people that they needed killed, and it was murder and The Italians would kill the Jewish guys and vice versa, so the families didn't suspect it was actually an inter-family killing. When the murders were carried out by strangers, it was a lot harder to track than when people killed each other when they knew each other. If there's any witnesses that see the people get killed, they don't know who it is, so they can't relate it back to who that person is working for. Anastasia's time in Murder, Inc. actually gained him a few new nicknames. The most popular one was the Mad Hatter, because he was kind of crazy, and he also became known as Lord High Executioner, because he didn't have any guilt about the people that he murdered. He decided who lived and died, and he was the executioner, and he had no guilt over that. He just did what needed to be done in his eyes. It's estimated that during its 10 years of operation, Murder, Inc. committed thousands of murders, and most of them were never solved. The base of operations for Murder, Inc. was above the Midnight Rose candy store in Brooklyn. Under Anastasia's rule, hits were organized, professional, efficient. They weren't murders. They were literally jobs. Murder orders were called contracts, and there was an advertising budget, and pretty much this was symbols of why somebody died. If they talked too much, their tongue would be cut out, and if they stole money, their hands would be cut off. There was a lot of other stuff, but you get the gist. When Murder, Inc. was created, the commission created a strict set of rules to go along with it. The chief number one cardinal rule, thou shalt not kill a boss. Some of the other rules were you don't kill civilians, and this isn't because they're just such good people. It's because it brings a lot more heat onto the family. When the media reports on a mafia hit, people tend to look the other way because the person was involved in the mafia. It's it's um, kind of like, well, what did you expect? But if they see that an innocent 
civilian was killed, they, they tend to get a little more upset. So that was one of the rules. Don't kill civilians. The next rule was something that they struggled a lot with. It was you don't kill policemen, journalists, judges, politicians, prosecution. And the reason for this was because if you kill any of these guys, all of their friends are going to come after the family. So if you kill a cop, all of the cops are going to start going after the family. If you kill a prosecutor, every prosecutor is going to start going after the family to try to avenge their fallen friends. So it was just easier to avoid this altogether, stay away from these guys, stay away from policemen, journalists, judges, politicians, and prosecution. Do not touch. Now, with Anastasia ruling Murder, Inc., it would have been completely understandable and, and honestly expected for him to begin ordering murders from his group. He had a group of personal killers on speed dial, but he didn't do that. He enjoyed murder. He liked killing people. And regardless of the power that he found within Murder, Inc., he continued to personally execute contracts himself just for the thrill of it. Even though he was known on the streets as a ruthless killer, there was a famous saying about him. He was a street devil and a house angel. His family did not see the merciless side of him. He was a completely different person at home. He and Elsa built a sprawling mansion in Fort Lee, New Jersey for $70,000. He made it home every single night for dinner. And his family really had no clue what his 9 to 5 was. So he would just go out 9 to 5 and kill people and come home for dinner every night, sit down with the kids and the family, and it was like nothing happened. When Thomas Dewey started to investigate Luciano, Anastasia also came under the limelight. Dewey was the district attorney in New York. And he was brilliant. He actually had more power than probably even J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover was the director of the FBI at the time. And Dewey probably had more power than him. So with Dewey's focus solely on the families, Anastasia started to build a plan to assassinate him. He had a full-blown plan. He staked out his apartment. He had aliases. He had disguises. He would watch him to learn his routines. He had everything down. He was ready. Ready to do this. Before he could do anything, the commission called on him and they told him he was not to make a move on Dewey. One of the cardinal rules is that you don't kill police and you don't kill prosecutors. It would have brought down intense heat on the entire leadership of the mafia if he had. So he listened. He didn't make a move against them. But soon Dewey arrested Luciano and had him sentenced to 30 to 50 years. So obviously this upset Anastasia and and then after he got Luciano put away, he started coming after Anastasia's partner, Lepke Bucalter. Dewey was coming after Bucalter for murder, so Bucalter was actually facing three murder charges. One of the murder charges was for Joseph Rosen, a Brooklyn candy store owner. Bucalter's union took over the truck union that Rosen was working for. He told Rosen to leave town because he thought that Rosen was cooperating with Dewey, but there was no evidence that he was actually doing that and to this day there's still no evidence that Rosen was ever cooperating with the government or with Dewey but Rosen refused to leave town Bucalter had him killed so that was one of the three charges that he was facing. Anastasia kept Bucalter in hiding while Dewey pursued him. Dewey offered a $25,000 reward for Bucalter's capture and Anastasia destroyed the case by sending his men to murder any witnesses in the murder case. Dewey went public and he told the media the body count of Bucalter and Murder, Inc. He was trying to turn the public against him and against the mafia in general. And for the most part, it did help. It did help turn the public against the mafia in general. Dewey did end up getting his hands on Bucalter. He had him arrested and charged for racketeering. And while he was serving his time at Leavenworth Federal Prison, he was tried for the four murders and he was found guilty. New York State took control of him and moved him to Sing Sing Prison on January 21st, 1944. Although Bucalter repeatedly begged for mercy, his pleas were rejected, and on March 4th, 1944, Lepke Bucalter was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing. He had no final words. Two other members of Murder, Inc. were also executed a few minutes before him. While he was running Murder, Inc., some of the hits that were ordered by Anastasia made national headlines and caused problems 
problems down the road. Morris Diamond, a Teamsters Union official in Brooklyn, stood in the way of Buchalter's garment district control, so Anastasia ordered him killed. Peter Panto, an ILA activist who was organizing union chapters to fight for democratic reforms, he was killed after he refused to be intimidated by the ILA threats. His body was found on a farm in New Jersey. A talent scout in Brooklyn, Abe Rells, had been sending hitmen to Murder, Inc. for 10 years. He went out, he found the guys that wanted to be in Murder, Inc. and carry out contracts for the mafia, and he would send them over. He would get a finder's fee. He was arrested, and he wanted to evade the death penalty, so he agreed to testify against Murder, Inc. Seven members of Murder, Inc. were convicted of murders that they had committed while they were working for Murder, Inc., and Rells knew a whole lot more than that. He had information that would implicate Anastasia in the murder of Morris Diamond and Peter Panto, so Anastasia put a $100,000 contract on his head. Rells was also the one that implicated Buchalter on the four murders. Rells, who was being watched by armed guards during one of the trials that he was testifying in, was found dead in a room on the sixth floor of the courthouse. A grand jury later ruled that his death was an accident, but nobody believes that. All of the officials believe that it was a murder. Anthony Romeo, a Murder, Inc. member who had been arrested and questioned about Panto's murder, was killed at Anastasia's request, and his body was found in Delaware with signs of a beating and a few bullet holes. In 1936, Luciano was in prison for compulsory prostitution for 30 to 50 years. But once World War II started, Luciano was actually able to negotiate a deal with the U.S. Navy where he would help them with their war efforts and in exchange, he would have his sentence commuted so he wouldn't have to serve the entire thing. Anastasia was the main point of contact for Luciano on the outside and he helped him accomplish any missions that needed to be fulfilled to complete his deal with the government. It's said that he might be the one that actually negotiated the deal for Luciano, and he ensured there would be no dock worker strikes during the war. He negotiated with the Navy on behalf of Luciano. He got them connected with the Sicilian Mafia before the Allied invasion on Sicily, and he even sunk a ship of the Axis powers that was docked in the Brooklyn Harbor. In 1942, a large number of Murder, Inc. members had been arrested, and Dewey was hot on Anastasia's tail. Anastasia escaped by joining the U.S. Army. He made it to technical sergeant. His job was to supervise soldiers on duties as longshoremen at Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. He became a U.S. citizen in 1943 as a result of his service, and he was honorably discharged after the war was over. Once he got out of the Army, he moved to New Jersey with his family. Luciano's sentence was commuted thanks in large part to Anastasia's efforts in 1945, and he was deported to Italy. The two, along with a small group of close friends, shared a farewell dinner the night before Luciano left the U.S. Anastasia was called by the U.S. Senate in 1951 to testify at the Kofer hearings regarding organized crime. The Kofer hearings were conducted by the Kofer Committee, which was established by five members of the U.S. Senate. After multiple cities and states had been calling for help, when they felt that they couldn't adequately handle the issue of organized crime. But the federal government didn't really have much jurisdiction, so this committee was formed of U.S. senators, and they were given special abilities to investigate, to make arrests, and they were able to make financial decisions to attempt to help the major cities in the U.S. that were asking for help. Anastasia invoked his Fifth Amendment rights and refused to answer any questions at the hearings. At the time, Anastasia was the underboss of the Mangano family, and he and Vincent Mangano, the boss of the family, did not get along. Mangano was very jealous of Anastasia's close ties to Luciano, and also to Frank Costello, and Mangano was mad that Anastasia worked for Luciano and Costello without obtaining permission from him first. The two fought regularly, and the tension led to continued business and personal altercations, and it almost came to blows a few times, which would have been really bad for Anastasia since Mangano was the boss of the family. On April 19, 1951, Vincent Mangano went missing, 
and his body was never found. The same day, his brother Philip's body was discovered in Jamaica Bay. Nobody was ever arrested, but everybody knows that Anastasia ordered the hit. As soon as the Manganos died, Anastasia started acting as the boss of the family. A meeting with the commission cemented his position as the boss of the family, and the family was renamed as the Anastasia family. Costello backed him up a lot with the commission, and Bonanno did as well, but he says that he just did it because he wanted to avoid a gang war. Joseph Falai Bocci was in Anastasia's family. He would later turn government witness, and he had a book written about him called The Veloci Papers, and the book was about him, what he said at trial, and a personal interview that the author had conducted with him. Veloci told the government that Anastasia killed Arnold Schuster, a witness that had identified Willie Sutton, a bank robber. Police didn't believe him, and nobody was arrested for that murder, but Veloci was able to give a lot of information about what was going on the family at the time. According to Veloci, Anastasia had been granting men membership for the small price of $50,000. This was totally against commission rules, and a lot of high-ranking mafia members knew about this, and they were mad. He also said that Anastasia lost a lot of money betting on horse racing, and that made him a lot more unpredictable and a lot crazier. Genovese, at the time, was trying to get control of the Luciano family. With Luciano gone, he was in Italy. The only thing he had to do was take out the acting boss. Frank Costello. But Genovese knew that he could not kill Costello without also killing Anastasia because of how close they were. Anastasia was crazy. Anastasia would have come after him and he knew it. He started to campaign against Anastasia. He used his reputation as a brutal killer as the reason that he should be killed himself and used his high body count as a reason that police would begin looking hard at the mafia and pretty much just turning everybody against him. Genovese promised Carlo Gambino that if he allied with him, he would make sure that Gambino took control of the Anastasia family after he was killed. Gambino, Anastasia, Genovese, and Luciano practically grew up together. They were in the Young Turks together. They basically invented the mafia all together, so they were really tight-knit growing up. But Genovese was a, for lack of a better word, a jerk. He spent years in Gambino's ear, convincing him that it was the only logical move to make. Every time Anastasia would do anything, Genovese would be in Gambino's ear. Oh, look, see, I told you, but... Genovese sucks. On June 3rd, 1955, Anastasia got a year in prison for tax evasion after he underreported his income in the late 40s. That's pretty much just a tool that the feds used to get them off the streets. After he got convicted, the federal government petitioned to revoke his citizenship so that he could be deported. They had actually been trying to do this for years. They had been saying that he lied on his citizenship application, but after this conviction, they were actually successful. But that ruling was overturned in September of 1955, and he maintained his citizenship. Genovese made his move to take control of the family when he had Vincent Gigante shoot Costello at his apartment building on May 2nd, 1957. Costello survived, but he relinquished control of the family to Genovese, and that's how it became the Genovese family that we know now. Bonanno arranged a sit-down between Anastasia and Genovese, and pretty much which prevented Anastasia from immediately killing Genovese because Anastasia was going to kill that man for what he did to Costello. On June 17, 1957, Anastasia approved the murder of Frank Scalise, his underboss. I don't really know why he approved it. The only thing that I can see is that Scalise was blamed for being the one to sell membership to the family, and maybe he approved the hit to, so that he could avoid being killed for that. He also approved the murder of Scalise's brother Joseph, who was also a member of the family. Again, I don't know why. On October 25th, 1957, Anastasia woke up and went to get a haircut at the Park Sheraton Hotel in Midtown Manhattan. This was a barbershop that he went to regularly, so there was nothing out of the ordinary this morning. His driver parked the car and took a little walk, and that left Anastasia without protection. And he usually made sure to have protection with him because of his status as boss of the family and how many people he had killed and ordered killed who 
would seek revenge to come back after him. I don't see anywhere that the driver was working with Genovese, but it seems like that could be the only answer. He had to have been working with Genovese. While Anastasia was sitting in the barber chair, having his hair cut, two men with scarves covering their face came in, shoved the barber out of the way, and shot Anastasia. He got up and attacked them, but since he had already been shot a bunch of times, he didn't realize that what he was actually attacking was their reflection in the floor-length mirror at the shop. They continued shooting until he died on the floor of the barber shop. Anastasia's murder was front-page news. The public was enamored with this murder. The media released film that was broadcast throughout the entire country, and it showed Anastasia's body laid on the floor of the barber shop. New York Times' Selwyn Robb wrote, the vivid image of a helpless victim swathed in white towels was stamped in the public's memory. The NYPD concluded that Genovese had ordered the hit with Gambino, but nobody was ever charged for the crime. Anastasia's body was interred at Greenwood Cemetery in Greenwood Heights, Brooklyn. The funeral service was at a Brooklyn funeral home. Like many other mafia members, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn refused the church burial. Soon after he passed away, his family changed their name to Inicio and left the country for Canada in 1958. Genovese, in true piece of garbage human being fashion, interferes with Gambino's ascension to the throne of the Anastasia family. Gambino was supposed to be officially named as the leader of the family at a meeting of the commission called the Appalachian Meeting. Genovese called the meeting, but then he reported it to police, and everybody that was there got arrested. Gambino's official appointment to the role was postponed to a later meeting. Anthony Anastasio, Albert's brother, had his power within the family taken away by Gambino after Albert's death. And good riddance, too. Anthony Anastasio, aka Tough Tony, quickly started to cooperate with the federal government. During these meetings, he told the feds that he believes his brother deserved to die. As I've discussed before on this channel, the FBI has to disclose secret documents after a certain certain amount of time has passed after the document entered the archives of the FBI. Recently, the minutes from the clandestine meetings with Tough Tony had been released after a Freedom of Information Act request was submitted for these documents. Tough Tony was the brother that Anastasia had left in power of the longshoreman in Brooklyn when he left for Pennsylvania. He trusted his brother, and Tough Tony was also the one who helped him sink the ship during their bid to get Luciano out of his prison sentence. Tough Tony was responsible for handing the feds information on who Jimmy Hoffa was allied with. I'll probably do an episode on Hoffa one day, so I don't really want to go into that too much right now, but keep an eye out for the Jimmy Hoffa episode because it's coming. It looks like it didn't even come out that Tough Tony was a rat until these documents were requested recently, within the last few years. So that means that only recently it was revealed that he was actually working with the feds, and his surviving family member wasn't too pleased to find that out. Their family remained tight-knit, and they were very, very, very very high profile, and some of them followed in Anastasia's footsteps. Anthony Scotto, Tough Tony's son-in-law, took over as the Brooklyn doc boss, and he was a member of the Gambino family after Tough Tony died. Tony died shortly after starting to work with the feds. His daughter, Marion Scotto, runs a fresco restaurant in Manhattan, and his other daughter is Rosanna Scotto, which is super surprising to me because I had no idea, and I know who she is, She's a very, very famous News 5 anchor in New York. So it's super surprising to hear that Rosanna Scotto, who I I grew up watching on Channel 5, is actually the daughter of Tough Tony. As for Albert Anastasia's children, Richard Anisio is a lawyer in Toronto, and Joanna married a policeman in Toronto. Elsa Anisio passed away on June 25th, 2008 from a kidney injury that had come from cardiac arrest in May of 2008. In a lawsuit filed about her end-of-life care, it said that she had symptoms of extreme fluid overload that damaged her internal organs and heart beyond repair. The lawsuit claim states that medical staff failed to provide proper treatment to save her life, 
and withheld information about her condition from the family, and in the case of three doctors, deliberately failed to follow instructions of her appointed decision maker. Her obituary reads that she is the mother of Richard Gloriana, who's married to Kenneth, Joanna, who's married to Larry, Bert, who's married to Betty, and had grandchildren named Catherine, Mark, Anthony, Nina, Annalisa, Tiffany, Tino, and Christina. Anastasia is portrayed in more media than I could list here. He He's one of the most famous Mafia members ever. If you ever saw The Irishman, he has a pretty big part in that movie. Obviously, it's not him, but he's represented. If somebody doesn't know who he is, if you say, oh, the guy that was killed in the barbershop, people know exactly who you're talking about. So that's the story of Albert Anastasio. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you sticking in there with me. And I hope you come back and drop a like and hit that follow button so that you could see the next time I put up an episode. See you next time.